Hi everyone, welcome to Woolen Spinning. This is episode 95. Um, I hope everybody is doing really well. On today's show, I have a Patreon giveaway. I have another giveaway to announce for everybody. Um, and I have a couple of uh, projects that I've been swatching for. So we're gonna have lots of swatch talk today. And I wanted to talk more in depth about my escarpment cowl, which is in the background and which will um, get into some more details about fit and what I thought about the pattern and everything. So we've got a full show and I hope that um, everybody's well wherever they are. We've got gorgeous sun outside, highs of 26, 27 right now Celsius. So hot for us and uh, everybody's in shorts and t-shirts and tank tops and it's really nice, you know, uh, beginning of May and we're getting some nice weather. I worry about the summer and drought and forest fires, but we're not there yet. So um, that's a future problem. <laughs> Um, I have, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to sit here for. So I initially thought that I had maybe herniated a disc in my back, but I actually haven't, which thank goodness, because I know those of you who've experienced herniated discs know how painful they are and I haven't, but I have, um, bruised a ligament in my back. So, um, sitting's okay, but for like really short periods of time and it's actually better for me to be up and moving around so um, we'll kind of keep the show a little bit shorter this week and I'm just hoping that we can cover everything and get through everything because I've got lots to share with you so in terms of giveaways um, I'm really pleased to um, announce uh, so we do a patreon giveaway every month and um, it's for this calendar and these ones that I'm giving out right now actually start in July because I was wanting to in this first half of 2018 I wanted to give out um, calendars that would actually be usable almost right away um, rather than putting it away somewhere because it's not good until January 2019 and then it gets forgotten about and you don't end up using it so um, this one that's going out this month is um, gonna go to Tessa she was our uh, patreon winner she just lives um, a couple of um, she actually lives about 20 minutes down the highway from me. So congratulations, Tessa. I'll get that off to you and uh, mail that out in the next week or so. So that is for our Patreon giveaway for the month. And then our other giveaway for the month. Uh, so uh, some of you will remember because you are um, uh, long-standing watchers of the show and you sort of know what's been going on with us. Um, last month in April we ended up not having a giveaway at all so I didn't have um, we didn't have a fiber giveaway at all so I just I kept saying we'd get to it and we just didn't get to it and with everything that was going on with Charlie and everything we just it got it was something had to get dropped and that got dropped so for May I said that we were gonna have a oh you're welcome Tessa um, we're gonna have a two uh, we're gonna have two giveaways so anybody can join in um, you just need to go into the Ravelry group to um, enter um, and I've linked the Ravelry group in the show notes um, which are available at patreon.com slash wellforpearls or at wellforpearls.com um, and the prompt for the month that you need to answer is tell us what your favorite spinning tool is so um, what can you not live without for a spinning tool it could be your wheel, it could be your spindles, it could be your drum carter, it could be something completely um, uh, that you we wouldn't even think of. It could be anything. Um, and you're, there's going to be two winners this month. I'm trying to keep the crinkle to a low because it's near uh, to a um, to a minimum because it's right near my uh, my mic here. Um, so you could be a lucky winner of one of two bats. So here is the first one. I don't know how much these weigh and I'm not sure how much they like this one has some sparkle in it I'm not sure how much they weigh um, they were really fun to make so there's that one this is sort of like the warm one I guess you could say and then there's this one so these have a huge variety of fibers in them they have silk noil firestar um, Merino, Corydale, Targi, um, what else do they have in them? Um, trying to think what else is in there. Firestar, Silicon Oil. Yeah, there's just like a huge variety in there. Silk, um, they're kind of art bats. They'll make a really textured, Charlotte, Charlotte, hey, no, sorry. She's doing something she shouldn't be doing. Um, 
Yeah, there's just a huge variety in them. They're not going to make, um, I did pull them off as a smooth bat, but they're going to be a little bit textured because of the silken oil in there. They're going to have some glitter because um, of the Firestar and the Angelina. And there's lots of different fibers in there. So there's going to be some shorter fibers, shorter stapled, a little bit longer stapled. So really how you spin it is up to you. One's cold, one's warm. Um, in the giveaway, so this will go all month and I'll draw a winner the first week of June. In the giveaway, um, when you say in the in the episode thread, so it'll be the May episode thread is where to pop in your response of what your favorite spinning tool is. If you could say just at the bottom of your post, so say like, uh, this is what my mind would look like. Um, my favorite spinning tool is my Magicraft Susie, and then at the and then press enter, give it a bit of space, and then at the bottom of your post, if you could say warm, cold, or either. So if you don't care which one you get, or if you would prefer the warm one, or if you prefer the cold one. So this one's the warm one, this one's the cold one. Greens and blues are cold colors. Orange, yellows, and reds are warm colors. If you could just say warm, cold, or either. If you say either, it means you don't care which one you get. If you could just put one of those three words in the bottom of your post, so because I'll be drawing two winners. So if one winner would prefer the warm one and one person would prefer the cold one, um, I'll try to accommodate that as best I can. Because I know some people love certain colors. Um, and if you say either, then if the other person has a preference, you'll get the other one. So I hope that's fair. Um, I'll try to accommodate people as best I can. If both people say that they like the warm, um, then we might have a problem. And if both people say they like the cold, then we might have a problem. But I'm sure it'll work out. So I hope that you win and everybody can, can enter that and can join that. So um, I, I made those on the drum carter last week and they were actually a lot of fun. I haven't pulled out my drum carter in a while. It's been a while since I've used it. And I, oh, I, it made me remember how much I love drum carding <laughs> and I love carded fibers and actually as I was making these two I was like oh I should make one for myself but I didn't get a chance because I had to go pick up Nora at school so I'm gonna I left it all out so that I would have a chance so that I would it would motivate me to go back and um, make one for myself so fingers crossed I can get back into the garage and um, and do that so I'm just looking in the chat channel really quick before we move on. Um, does anybody know if Rachel has done an episode on the various types of silks? No, I haven't, Carissa. Um, that's not a subject I've gotten into. Um, some, I think it's mulberry silk. They kill the worms. Tessa silk, they don't, but it's not. It's considered not as high quality. Um, noils are um, silk. Noils are like the um, the waste products of silk. I think. Um, so they give you a little bit more texture and then there's like silk carrier rod which comes off of the rods that they reel the silk off of. You have to wash it, degum it, but it's beautiful stuff. Um, there's tons of stuff out there on silk and I just haven't kind of gone there. To be honest with you, um, and I think that many of you will understand this, um, there's so much like information out there about spinning and all the different things like there's plant-based fibers, there's silk, there's wool. Um, there's everything in between. There's all the ephemera that you can throw in, like Firestar and Sari Silk and Thread. And I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on. You, you sort of have to bite it off in little chunks. Like you can't sort of delve into it and expect to know all the things about all the things. Like even um, wool, we tend to kind of have our favorites. Like some people really love spinning the fine wools. Some people like spinning the long wools. Some people prefer spinning the miscellaneous wools. Like there's just so much... Um, in terms of knowledge and what you can tackle and to be honest like I've only just like started you know I, I'm at the tip of the iceberg in terms of my knowledge like I look at what other some of the other spinning instructors and people out there who are really at the forefront of this niche and um, and what they know and I'm just blown away by their knowledge um, and you know it's it, it's there's always more to learn, right? There's always more to more to chip off and more to to um, focus on. Um, and silk is one of those things I haven't gotten into yet. Plant-based fibers. I was asked. It was funny because years, a couple of years ago, when I spoke at the Vancouver Weavers and Spinners Guild, they asked me to come in and just sort of talk about what I do and all that kind of stuff. And so I did. Um, and it was funny because one of the questions was actually from, I think it was my friend Ruth actually that asked it. She said, um, she asked if I had gotten into the plant-based fibers or if I was mostly focused on wool. And like at that point, plant-based fibers hadn't even like come on my radar, let alone 
actually sitting down to learn how to spin them. So, uh, and now, and I said to her, like, I don't know what the future holds. Like maybe one day I will go into plant-based fibers, but like at this point, I'm kind of very focused on wool. Sure enough, you know, th two, three years later, I've sort of added that one more thing to my, to my spinning repertoire, if you will. So we're always, we're always changing what we do and growing and adding more things to our, to our knowledge base. So yeah, that's my little thing about, about that. You guys know, those of you who've been spinning for a long time, I think you under, you probably still feel like there's so much that you don't know and so much that you still need to learn. Um, and that's very much how I feel. All right. Let's move on to the show. screens around um, I don't see Eve in the uh, chat channel just yet I'm hoping that she'll join us but um, I'm gonna show you a project that I was thinking about making um, and then we'll go from there because I have a couple of things to say so just bear with me as the cameras change around hi Elizabeth hi Carolyn um, okay so hopefully this is showing up on your screen okay and it's sort of transitioning to an, a new uh, a new screen and a totally different screen that we haven't used before so this is anchors cardigan it's by petite net I'm not sure what her real name is because she just uses petite net on everything some of you may have seen this so it's got it's a top-down um, raglan and it's got um, it's a one by one rib and then you increase out as you build the yoke and then eventually you get to sort of the top of what I would say like the armpit so you're sort of two-thirds through the yoke and then you work in stockinette for the rest of it and then you divide for the sleeves so um, you guys will remember that I spun for um, I spun that that how much did I have was it a, I think it was a pound of Romney mohair um, and you remember all these big skeins that I had and like every single one of them is like 375 yards, 440 yards. Um, I think one of them is like 480. Anyways, I ended up with this massive yardage and I ended up with this yarn that sort of, um, hopefully you can see that in the, in the screen. Oh no, sorry. I keep forgetting. I'm, I've got a different setup here. Um, so this yarn, it's this, it's my Romney mohair. Um, it, it sort of spun up to like a, like a heavy fingering light sport. Um, it's, it's, it's very consistent. Um, and I would say sort of after washing and whatnot that it kind of poofed up to, I think for some people it would be a heavy fingering and for some people it would be a sport. And I think it just would depend on how you did your wraps per inch. Um, so what I've been really torn about is because I have just over 1400 yards, it's a lot of yarn. Um, I think I had mentioned on a previous podcast episode about maybe uh, taking all of the yarn and um, four plying it. So either making a cable ply, so to putting all the yarn back through, tightening it up, and then cabling it, or just doing what you're really not supposed to do and four plying it. So taking the two 440 skeins and cable plying them so one two 440 skeins would become sort of like instead of um 880 yards they would sort of become more like around like 400 yards each and I was thinking about making a pullover that actually I think it was Kelly shared in the slack channel that I really loved and I've queued it I am going to make it but not out of this yarn so I kind of decided not to do that because this yarn has the mohair in it and it's a little bit heavier and a little bit denser um and so this yarn, this sweater is knit on three millimeter needles. I think it's three, yeah, it's three millimeter needles. It's quite a dense fabric. And I'm going to switch the cameras back in a minute so that you can see the swatches and everything. And we'll have a discussion about the swatches. Um, and so it knit up really nicely. And I swatched for this cardigan. And then the other cardigan that I swatched for, and I'm going to switch my cameras again. 
is the Sparkle Cardigan by Hohi Locatelli. So this is a new pattern release, and it kind of came across my... Um, like I noticed it and saw it because it is knit out of, I think it's Cashless Luxe Spark, I think is what the yarn is called, and it's a Sweet Georgia base, um, which is why I kind of um, twigged to it, because it was in the Sweet Georgia newsletter. It's one of the only newsletters that I open when it comes into my inbox, um, mostly because I've worked for Sweet Georgia and I um, am such good friends with Felicia. So when I saw this come through my box, I was like, oh, I really like that. I really like the texturing. Um, it goes along the back as well. The back of the cardigan is not stockinette. The whole thing is this lace pattern. And while I really want to knit Acker's cardigan, it actually calls for between 400 and, uh, sorry, um, 100, 1400 and 1500 yards for the size that I would want to make because I like a lot of ease now. I used to wear my clothes a lot tighter than I do now. And then the same thing for this one. So it's knit on 3.75 millimeter needles. The yarn weight that's called for in both patterns is the same. Um, and this cardigan calls for more like 1200 to 1400. So I wouldn't be worried about running out of um, yardage because with the Acker's cardigan, I was probably gonna have to shorten up the sleeves and do three quarter sleeves if I ran out of yarn. Um, so this way I'm not worrying about whether or not I can make the full sleeves or whatever. And if you notice on Hohi in the, in the, um, uh, I should go this way, <laughs> in the cardigan, you'll notice that the sleeves are really super long. Like they're about two inches longer than I would personally knit them. Um, only because I'd be constantly pulling at them if they came down over my hands like that. Like if you notice the, on her right hand arm, so the furthest arm from, from me, um, that's pretty long, like it's coming down over her thumb. Um, and you can see there's that, that they pulled it up slightly around her wrist. So like that's a really long sleeve. I bet you fully extended that sleeve comes past her thumb. So some of the things to think about, um, the it probably stretched when it was blocked um, because that's pretty long for any sweater. Normally fully extended, the sleeve should only come to the bottom of your thumb. So, um, I've pretty much decided on the sparkle cardigan and I'll just change my cameras around one more time so that um, we can talk about the swatches. So I did swatch for both and um, one of the things that I really noticed about this yarn um, was the density of the mohair. So even though it's an 85, I think it's 80-20 or 85-25 or 75, 25, I think it's 80, 20. Um, it's, it's quite substantial. Like once I started working with it, I was like, oh yeah, this is, you know, it's, it's got some, it's got some nice, a nice um, density to it. It doesn't have a ton of drape, like a lot of, um, it's drapey, but it's got some, what's the opposite of drape? It, it holds its, its form. Like it, these were washed and blocked a week ago and they have not changed at all. Um, and I've played with them and, um, you know, I've moved them around and they just seem to really hold their shape. Now this swatch is knit on 3.75 millimeter needles. Um, and this one, same number of stitches, um, is three millimeter needles. So you can see there's a huge difference between the two and I can actually zoom in a bit so you guys can really see the difference between the two swatches. So let's move this out of the way. It's hard doing this when um, everything's backwards for me. So like, there we go. Do you guys see that? Um, yeah, spongy. Um, Becca says spongy is always what I think of at the other end of the spectrum from drape. Yeah, it's spongy. That's a good, a good, uh, but not soft. So not spongy in the sense of like squishy and spongy. Um, like, like this is Falkland and like it's very spongy and it's squishy. I knit loosely enough. It has a nice drape like on my escarpment cowl, but this has some form to it that, um, that, This drapes nicer than this because it's a looser gauge, but you can see how dense this one is. Like you can see this one doesn't have any white space, whereas this one you can see a bit of white space. Um, this one, like you can see through it a little bit. Um, you see how you can see through, kind of? 
Um, this one, you can, it's totally dense. You can't see it through it at all. So I'm not sure that this would actually work very well for a big sweater. The Acris cardigan, even if I had enough yardage, which I kind of do, like I said, I would probably just shorten the sleeves. I think it would end up being quite a dense cardigan. It would be very, very warm. Mohair is really, it's a very warm fiber. Um, I think it would be a really, really nice sweater, um, but it's, and it's got a lot of stretch to it. Both of them do. Um, they've got, the stitch definition is really nice on both of them. Um, the sparkle cardigan has you swatch in stockinette stitch for the lace, um, which is maybe why the sleeves stretch so much. Um, I'm just assuming that they stretched a lot. I don't know that for certain. I haven't read through the whole pattern, although I have bought it. Um, the sleeves just seem a bit long um, based on what you would expect for a standard fitting cardigan. Um, but this swatch down here, like it's, it's a lot of stitches. It's the same number of stitches and yet it's significantly smaller. Um, it's about two thirds the size of the other one. So that says to me that like it's gonna make quite a dense fabric and um, it, it, good word karma, like it's a very, it'll be a very structured, but it won't have a lot of, of drape. It'll probably actually be a really beautiful sweater. It'll probably look like a store-bought sweater that's really high quality. But I think in terms of our climate and how warm it can get here, especially in the fall, we can have beautiful days, but then we can have this wind and this breeze. I think this will really work nicely. There's a part of me that was actually thinking about taking the 3.75 millimeter swatch, this, and plugging it all plugging it into the anchors cardigan and actually doing all the math and modifying it so that I could still have that really interesting yoke and then I'd have enough to make longer sleeves and all that kind of stuff. But um, I've kind of decided to leave well enough alone and not to do that um, because I think what I'm going to do is actually spin this same yarn um, from, do you guys remember Lori of Disdero? gifted me with this big thing and I'm going to give some of this to you guys but um, I think I'm going to spin the exact same yarn. I might be a sucker for punishment because <laughs> um, talking about it now that I'm like saying it out loud I'm like mm, do I really want to do that? Anyways I was thinking I would spin for and make the exact same yarn because this is the same base it's just it's um, a little bit less I think it's 85.15 instead of 80.20 um, and I would actually make the anchors cardigan but in the brown because this swatch is so gorgeous it's just that um, I don't really have enough yardage and I don't have any more fiber so that's my thoughts and um, I'm glad that I went I got super sick of it Rebecca <laughs> it was such a um, labor of love at the end it was just crazy um, However, it was just spinning straight white for a really long time and I didn't work on it um, very much. So I, I think part of what happened and part of the problem was I wasn't working on it exclusively. So I wasn't getting through it like I normally do. Like normally spins for me happen relatively, like I'm quite monogamous with my projects and I kind of just work till it's done and then I move on to the next thing. And I think the problem is with this one is I had about four or five other things going on at the same time and I didn't really put in that time to just get it done. Um, because I like this swatch so much, it really motivates me to want to make the yarn. And I think I would hang this on my wheel, um, you know, off the side and like remind myself like why I'm putting in the work and why I'm doing it to kind of keep myself inspired and keep myself motivated. The one thing I will say is I'm really surprised. I knew the yarn was quite consistent, but it's really consistent when I knit it up. And that was a huge like, oh, you know, all that time and all that effort really felt nice to be validated when I started knitting with it, that yes, it was worth it to put in all of that time to spin it well and to do such an, a good job on it. Um, and then to have the, the um, what's that word? The, um, oh, not validation, but the, uh, the reward at the end that that hard work paid off basically. Um, and I really like the color. I still may dye it, but I don't know. I may just leave it as the natural white because um, I do really love this cream color and it's a color that I can wear because I can't wear a lot of white. Um, some of the really stark whites like this, that's the background here, um, is really hard on me. I can't wear it against my skin, but this creamy white is a nice color for me. So I may actually leave it as the cream. I'm not sure. 
I might ask Katrina to help me if I wanted to dye it, but I think I probably will just leave it as the cream, as the natural cream. Especially after all that effort to spin it, I'm not sure I want to then start dyeing it. So that's sort of where I'm at with the swatches. And what I've actually done is I've, um, so this is this is um, the remainder of the ball and I'm gonna leave this. I'm, I'm probably not gonna knit from this ball if I don't have to. Um, I'm gonna start winding up the other big skeins and um, I'm actually gonna set it aside because it's gonna be my summertime knit. I'm gonna work on this when we're traveling this summer and when we're away camping and whatnot rather than starting it right now. I started, um, it's just a side note. I started uh, the I don't, Wolf River, I think it's called. Um, some of you will be familiar with this um, uh, with this pattern. It's um, it's been around forever. Um, Dandelion Girl designed it, and actually, I'm not sure what her real name is. I can't remember it. Melissa something. Um, it's, as soon as you see it, you'll you'll know exactly the pattern that I'm talking about. Melissa, and I can't even say her last name. Um, Shaskaway. I don't want to completely botch her name. But this um, is the what I'm making. Oops. Everything's backwards. Did I mention that? It's really throwing me off today. So I'm actually knitting this right now. Um, and it... I'm doing it in some of my stash yarn. Um, I'm actually knitting it um, out of Cascade 220. I finished the back. Um, I've been working on it at work because I don't knit that much at home right now because of the gorgeous weather and being outside so much. But I've actually been knitting it in a dark brown. It's actually very similar to my Romney mohair that I just showed you. Um, I've I finished the back in, and I, I'm doing it just as per the pattern, just what it's called for. And then I'm actually three quarters of the way up the front. So I'm hoping that I might actually finish that this weekend, the front, and then I can seam it, sew it up, because it's sewed up the sides, and then it's a drop shoulder, so you actually, um, it's kind of an interesting construction, because the way that the pattern is written, and because of the wide lace panel, there's, it's a very interesting sweater. I'm sure she had a very difficult time grading it, and a very difficult time writing the, the, the sizing on it because there's big gaps between the sizes and then really sh small gaps between some of the other sizes and I think it's probably because of that lace those lace panels so you seam it up the side and then you count from the top of the three needle bind off across the shoulder um, across here you count so when you have it laying out not on the body obviously but like when you're laying it out on the table you count from here um, down a certain number of rows so that you get to a certain point and then you pick up from from the bottom marker all the way around and you knit straight out for your sleeves. So that's going to be really interesting because I have really big arms. My arm my circumference of my biceps are, and of my upper arm is um is quite big. So I actually added length to the torso like because you you sort of knit until she tells you to shape for the shoulders. So I added length um, because I'm long torsoed for one, because I remember I had to add length to this, which I've done and it's done. I just have to weave in all the ends. Um, and I'll talk about that on another show. Um, I added length to the torso of like to the length of the sweater. This isn't making a lot of sense. I hope you guys are following me. And then I also added length to this part of the, like where the, um, shaping for the shoulder starts and I'm hoping that that gives me enough space so that when I have when I measure from the top of the shoulder down to where I need to mark for the circumference of the arm to fit through that that added extra inch or so that I need for the circumference of my arm will actually fit so just to give you an idea, I'm somewhere between sort of a 33 and 35 inch bust when I'm picking patterns. Um, my upper bust is around here, so this is your upper bust um, right, up, right beneath your armpit and up here. Um, this is a 30, 33, I think I measure, 33, 33 and a half. And then my actual bust, which you're not supposed to, that's not supposed to be the measurement that you pick when you pick for sweater pattern sizing. You're supposed to go based on your upper bust size. Um, so around here, I'm 35 and a half, 35, depending on the day and water retention and whatnot. So 
when I knit a pattern, because you're supposed to have a little bit of negative ease through your actual bust, and then you're supposed to have um, positive ease through your waist so that it doesn't look really, really super tight here, and then you're supposed to have negative ease through your hips so that a sweater, whether it's a pullover or a cardigan, looks like it fits you through here, it looks like it fits you through here, and with some negative ease here, it gives an ease to the clothing that it makes the clothing look like it's really super tailored and that it's fit re, that it fits you really well. So if you give yourself a little bit of ease through your waist, it actually makes your waist look a little bit smaller because a lot of people think if you cinch in your waist and give yourself your clothing that real hourglass shape that that will create that look of a really small waist. But for many people like myself where I'm a I'm a true hourglass. My my shoulder width and my hip width are exactly the same. So I'm like your true hourglass, like I'm like Marilyn Monroe or whatever. Um you if you give yourself a little bit of um of positive ease through here, you create that illusion of um, an hourglass. So for those who carry, um, who maybe don't have a smaller waist than their bust or their hips, you can create that by giving yourself a little bit of ease through your waist. Does that make sense? <laughs> Kelly just said I just blew her mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, if that's not clear, I would really recommend that you read um, Amy Herzog's book, books, Fit to Flatter, that series. She goes through all of that and she goes through all of the different body shapes and whatnot. Um, but it really helps if you know where you need the ease and where you don't. So you want things to be slightly tighter across your bust if you're a woman. You want things to be slightly tighter across your hips. And then you want things slightly looser around your waist. Um, so full circle with this sweater, um, and people are texting me so I turn my phone off. Um, the um, What I'm hoping for with this sweater is if I give myself a little bit more length through the torso, then from here to here, I'll have enough space for the width of my arms. <laughs> I always fall down rabbit holes with sweaters and sweater shaping and stuff because, because I find it endlessly fascinating. Um, and I don't know if I ever told this story because I think it was pre the podcast. Um, so I'm going to fall down another rabbit hole for just one sec, but just bear with me because I know there are sweater knitters out there. Um, I knit this sweater and actually if you don't mind holding on for a sec, I'll bring it up and show you show it to you guys because um, I, I think it'll help envision why this whole shoulder arm thing is such a big deal. It, it makes a sweater look like it fits you versus not looking like it fits you if you take the time to fit them properly. And um, there's a lot of resources out there to help you to learn how to do some of this stuff. So like Fit to Flatter is, is one series that has really helped me. My phone's having a tough time this week. It's, it's actually stopped working on me a couple of times. So I'm like just holding my breath and hoping that it just keeps working. Because I really don't want to buy a new sweat, a new phone. Okay, just bear with me. Here we go. Okay, so this cardigan, one of my favorite cardigans. It's one of my most worn cardigan. Um, however, I learned a ton after making it. So this cardigan here, and I hope you guys can see that. This is the Cozy Me, and it's by um, some, I'll link it in the show notes. It's by Nadia Krichen. Um so this cardigan is a perfect example of a cardigan that really should have fit me absolutely perfectly. And it doesn't. I still wear it a ton because I absolutely love it. And I can make it fit and make it work. So it, it's okay. But this cardigan was one of these types of cardigans where it was meant to have sort of a... Uh, it was knit from the bottom up. And then you separate for the sleeve, separate for the fronts and the backs, and you knit up here. So just like this, um, like my tank top that I'm wearing today, except that it was wider. And it came up, and then you did a three needle bind off across the top. Not a big deal. Very straightforward. So where the pattern gets really interesting, and I I love this um, technique. However, like I said. I have big shoulders. Like my my I was a swimmer. My 
my upper body is slightly overdeveloped. Every time I see my physio or my chiropractor, he's one in one in the same. He's always like, your upper body is so overdeveloped. And it's because like, I've got big traps. If you notice, like my, you know, like I'm just, I'm very upper body, even though I'm an hourglass. And that's just because I carry my weight around my hips. So my shoulders, my, my arm sky, which is this here, I need a certain amount of space to accommodate the space from here where the front of the sweater ends, the shoulder and, and the sleeve starts all the way around to the back where the sleeve ends and the back of the sweater starts. This is a big space, like it's actually bigger than my hand. My hand doesn't even reach all the way back. Um, so like from the front here all the way back to the back, I can't even reach it. That's how big it is. So, um, and then my, the, the circumference of my bicep, like this around is like 12 and a half or 13 inches or something, which is, which is quite big for somebody with an upper bust of 34. So if you think about it, a sweater like this, where you knit it up to the top, you bind off up here. And then this sweater, and there's lots of them out there that are like this. You pick up for the arm sky around those stitches. So you've got the front, and you're, you're basically picking up along here all the way around. And that creates the hole for the sleeve. So if you think about it on like a flat surface, you've got the sweater like this. And this, envision this is my, this part here. So envision this is, this is the front of the cardigan and this is the under underarm, right? So if you think about that and you're picking up stitches, you're basically building the sleeve out like this um, in, a, in like a straight line, kind of. So what they get you to do is work short rows in here so that you build out the sleeve cap. The problem with that, and it's the reason why this cardigan doesn't fit me as well as it should, is if you have any mass in your shoulders or your shoulders are slightly wider or your wingspan from side from the from this side to this side across your back if it's wide and you need that extra length to build out to fit your shoulders it's always going to fall off your shoulder because there's not enough physical fabric to fit over your shoulder. Does that make sense? So right here, so you see how this looks like a drop shoulder, but it's not. That line where the seam is, oh, come back. This line where the seam is, I'm gonna try not to touch it. I'll maybe grab a pen. <laughs> I feel like a teacher, this is hilarious. This line, my, my, my arm, this is halfway down my arm. It's like here and it should be up here. It's about through two, maybe two inches away from where it should be. So this should actually be up here, if that makes sense. So that means there's not enough fabric in here where the short rows were worked. So these are all short rows along here. Where the short rows were worked, there's two inches of fabric that's missing to lift it up and bring it up to where, to where it should be. Does that make sense? Um, Becca makes an interesting comment, probably why you like raglans. Exactly. It's because I need that space in my in my shoulders. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I can wear raglans and why they look so good on me and why other people say, oh, I hate raglans. They don't fit me properly. It's because you don't have all of this filling out your raglan, whereas I do because of my swimming history. Um, it it I, a raglan really works because my shape fills the raglan out. Whereas in some people, there's nothing there and the raglan, there's nothing for the raglan to fill. Whereas I fill them out and I, um, and they work on me. That's why different sweater shapes work so well on different people. So for me, I need that extra space in here and other people don't. And a sweater like this knit to fit them, not knit too big or knit too small, but knit to fit them would fit them okay because they don't have all this extra um, space that they need because they maybe don't have the muscles I have and the, well, it's mostly muscle. Um, they just don't have that mass in there. Does that make sense? Um, I do do the short rows. That's with the short rows. So that was with the short row shaping to build out the arm cap, the sleeve cap, and it's still not enough on the on these sweaters. Most of these sweaters, there's not enough stitches to build out a big enough sleeve cap to accommodate somebody's shoulders. And it's why these sweaters are constantly falling off your shoulders. Um, a raglan that I knit um, a, a couple years ago, same thing. It wasn't um, deep. It was too. There were there. 
you cast on way too many stitches around here that it was constantly falling off. And when you look at people's project pages on Ravelry, once you start to learn some of this stuff, you start to pick up on it and you start to see it in other people. Like their sweaters are constantly falling off their shoulders. Um, so even with those short rows, it doesn't build it out enough because it, it kind of, you've only got so many stitches to work with in your short rows. Um, I probably needed to actually work that the entire repeat of short rows. I probably needed to work them twice to get enough stitches to build that sleeve cap out. So let me catch up with the chat channel because you guys are um, talking a lot, <laughs> which is good. I'm glad this is sparking a conversation. That's the whole point. Um, I know what you mean, uh, Rebecca. So she said um, that she loves knitting sweaters, but it sometimes feels like a bit of a crapshoot that it'll look good because I don't know how to think through this stuff. So my biggest piece of advice, if I can give unsolicited advice, um, is to read some of those books out there like Fit to Flatter. I keep mentioning Fit to Flatter, but it was the one that was the most helpful for me um, in terms of learning how to do some of this shaping. Not because you're necessarily going to use the, um, what's the Amy Herzog software that she uses? Um, it's the sweater program. You guys will remember. Anyways, not because you're necessarily going to make those types of sweaters, but it just when you read some of the read her books, it just gives you more information about um, some of the how some of this stuff fits. Um, oh, good. So Karma, it explains so much. I, she has bigger shoulders too. Um, that view really helps. Her shoulder fit does look uncomfortable. Yeah, it just slides off my shoulders all the time. Um, Oh, so there you go, Kelly. Yep, swimmer at an early age and continued on. So you have huge shoulders, and that's part of why you struggle with hand-knit sweaters. Yeah, it was a huge aha moment when, um, so a few years ago, my physiotherapist, who I'd been with forever, um, she had the audacity to move back to Montreal to her family. <laughs> they wanted, she was getting married and having kids and all doing all that stuff, and they wanted to be nearer to her, their families again. And I was like, no, you can't leave me. Anyways, she put me with a new practitioner, and um, I was really wor custom fit. That's what it is. And I was really like leery about seeing somebody new because I'd been with her for so long. And it was funny because the first thing that he said to me, he put his hands on my shoulders and he's like, you have really big shoulders and traps. And I was like, <laughs> thanks. And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, it's a good thing because we can, we can tweak you and fix you and it's totally fine. And like, um, but it may, it kind of like all the pieces fell in place when I learned that it was like, Oh, that's why sweaters don't fit me very well, especially store-bought sweaters. Cause they tend to be cut and made a lot smaller through the, um, yoke. Um, yeah, bus fitting often makes the shoulders too wide for me and they fall down all the time. Um, I think that's one of the things for lots of people out there. So as soon as they get a great fit through sort of from here down, then up here is either too big or too small. So knowing what your measurements are really, really helps. Um, um, yeah, Amy Herzog stuff is great. Um, Elizabeth says, sorry, I didn't mean to add to the actual. Um, short rows to the front and back. Are you talking like Elizabeth to like lift up the back? Um, when you're adding short rows, are you sort of talking about that? Or are you talking about like short rows through the bust? Um, like where, where are we adding short rows? Are you, cause I, cause you have to add short rows to the back to lift the pieces up at the back for sure. And that gives you a little bit more length through the back to add more stitches. If you're doing those picked up sleeves for sure. Um, but it still for me personally, isn't enough. Um, yeah, cause it just adds more length, um, to widen the shoulder. Yeah, short rows through there, I think mostly just add length. Um, if you want to add, if you want to add width through here, you'd have to add short rows back and forth on the actual sleeve itself. Um, I have to think about that some more. So let me think about that, Elizabeth, because um, I'm not, I've, I've not tried that, but I, I always add short rows to the back of my pieces always to lift up the back. Um, and if, if anything, it just adds length. Um, Anyways, we probably should move on. Um, so that is my like sweater ramp. We've gotten into some good sweater talks the last couple of episodes. Um, that's been kind of fun. I love talking about sweaters. I love knitting sweaters. I've kind of gotten out of the habit of knitting a lot of sweaters because um, I just don't wear them in our climate. And I ended up donating quite a few and um, that I had made that were older. And it kind of put me off of 
um, knitting so many of them and I was sort of feeling a bit bummed about about sort of not having the same yeah just not not knitting as many as I was so um, it's nice to be able to sort of think about some of these projects and I'm I think I've talked about this on the show before one of the things that I've really been working on is um, being taking taking on these sort of larger projects but over a longer period of time so like a bigger spin longer spins really using up my stash um, and um, um, just be more intentional but the projects take longer so in some ways there's less to talk about on the podcast but then in other hand on the other hand I feel like I'm really making stuff like my pot blanket I feel like I'm really making stuff that I really love and that I'm really um, enjoying the process and just taking more time if that makes sense so um, yeah it it's it means we kind of get into like the real nitty-gritty details of some of this stuff and I know some people are like no that's too detailed for me and I'm not that interested and that's totally fine I totally get that um, but I really like looking at all this different stuff because I feel like over time you really learn a lot, um, or at least I do, um, and I feel like I really, um, yeah, that I learn a lot, and, and like I apply that learning to, to um, later projects, so thank you for bearing with me and for, uh, yeah, for, for doing that, um, having that discussion with me. So this is, I'll just look really quickly in the chat channel, and then we're going to move on to, uh, to this. Um, yeah, Becca and I talked about this before, actually. Fitting projects with lifestyle and climate is one of the more interesting learning curves that she has. I have really changed um, the projects that I make and the stuff that I um, um, make as priority. Um, and I think a lot of that, it's just we're, our climate is getting so warm. And when we have cold in the winter, it's for such short period of periods of time that like you need a really heavy winter jacket and then that's it. It's warm again. So figuring out that balance has been really hard. Um, the green Elizabeth's just talking with the lovely lace detail. Oh yeah, that was some, um, so the sweater Elizabeth's just wondering about the sweater that I had hanging up uh, behind me for a long time. So that was, um, I still have it. It's upstairs actually. That was, um, a sweater that I knit for Katrina, um, for out of one of, it was when the delicious DK had just come out the base. Um, and it was the campsite. Um, and I heavily modified that pattern to fit me. Um, and I knitted out of her, um, um, her yarn out of river's end. It was this cardigan. Oh, I moved the cameras around, so I'll bring it up here for you guys. That was this cardigan. It's a lace panel at the back, but that was the camp side um, by Alicia Plummer. It's um, it's a gorgeous sweater. I really like that one. Um, all right, so this is the escarpment cowl. I can't remember who knits it, but it'll be in the show notes. Quite a few people in the Ravelry group made this, or um, sorry, in the Slack channel made this. Um, it was Becca originally, actually, Bethy Forty, who... Um, made this and the rest of us went oh we love that we wanted to make it too and I jumped on the bandwagon so it's it's four gradients um this is the ancient arts yarns um uh she sells seashells I think the colorway is called um I didn't know that it was dyed as a gradient I'm not sure it was supposed to be a gradient I think it's just the way I ended up spinning it because I divided the braid in half spun it end to end and this is sort of what ended up coming out I absolutely love how this turned out um, the back is sort of interesting. It does this V thing at the back because of the uh, shaping. And then you can see how wide it is on me. So my yarn, I had about 425 yards. I, the only, I have this little bit left and I think this ended up being like 11 yards or something. Um, it's just a teeny tiny amount. Um, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, Oh, so it's more like 30 yards left. Um, it was enough that I couldn't make it around one more time and cast off. And um, there's a couple of things about this that I will... So this is Falkland, 100% Falkland. Um, it, I love that it looks like it was naturally dyed. Like I love that it um, has sort of this feel to it that's um, not super, super acid dye, super, super bright. It's a little bit more muted. Um, the purples and the grays in there are just absolutely gorgeous with a little bit of blue. 
Um, I used a cast off that is um, an elastic bind off. So all through here, it gives it a little bit more drape. It meant I could stretch it a little bit more when I was blocking it. So I'd, I would do that again if I was uh, making this again. I knit the bottom, um, I didn't actually follow the pattern. Once I knew what I was doing, I just ignored the pattern. Um, but you can see how wide it is on my shoulders. And it's funny because when I'm wearing it with my winter vest, I have to like tuck it up because otherwise it like sticks out down here on my vest. Um, the one thing I would change is the neck piece. So she tells you to knit until from here to here until this is a certain length um, and I'm not going to say what it is because it's it's in the pattern and it is a paid for pattern um, I would shorten it so I think if I were to do it again and I think Mari said the same thing that she would have shortened it as well um, it, it's okay but it's like it needs to be tightened up just a little bit like it needs about an inch on each side so two inches shorter to really stand up and be nice like that does that make sense so I wish it was two inches shorter um, in that space around because um, I did follow the pattern up to that point and then I and then I ignored it after that so um, what I've been doing to wear it is I'm um, folding it over um, just to give it a little bit more structure here although it's too warm now to wear it it's like Oh my goodness, it's been so hot. It was like 28 on Sunday. It was crazy. Um, but yeah, it's got a really nice, like it's just a great pattern. Um, I would, I, I'm really seriously thinking about knitting this again. Um, I knit this one on 3.5 millimeter needles. I can't remember anything today, you guys. I just, oh my goodness. I feel like I'm having to check everything. Um, and I think it's just because I'm, it's because of my back. It's because I wasn't expecting to have anything wrong with my back. Um, 3.75 millimeter needles. And so, and this was a heavy fingering light sport again. This was one of my earliest hand spun yarns. And I, there are sp spots where it was quite a bit thicker. Um, but it, in the end, it didn't matter. This is why when you knit with your hand spun, even if you feel like it's beginner yarn, don't worry about it. Just knit with it. Because this is what ends up coming out. And it's, perfect and I've had several compliments on it um, in wearing it and people say oh I love that where did you get it and that's really nice um, the other thing that I did by accident is um, <laughs> you guys are gonna laugh because you'd think that I would twig right away but no um, I wanted to knit it from so I wanted this end to be up by my face and this end to be down like I wanted it basically to be reversed and I literally got to the point where I was connecting the two. Like, that's a lot of knitting. Like, I got all the way to here. To here. So I did all of this up here. I got all the way to here before I realized that I had started from the wrong end of the ball. Can you believe it? <laughs> I was like, when's the green coming? Why isn't the green and purple coming yet? It shouldn't be so much red. Did I stop and knit and figure that out no I just kept knitting so <laughs> anyways the only reason for that is because I, I don't love like the red against my face and my skin this red works and it's fine um, but it's not my best color whereas um, it would have been nice to have this end up against my face because of my eyes but that's okay say lovey it is what it is so that is the escarpment cowl. If you want to join in on the knit along, um, people are still talking about it in the Slack channel. Um, and we can start a little thread in the Ravelry group if people are interested. This is specifically designed for gradient yarn, but you could use anything. I'm actually going to knit it um, out of some highly textured yarn that I've been hanging on to for a really long time and haven't really known what to do. The other thing I think you could do with this pattern once you've knit it and you're familiar with it is you could put in a lace pattern really easily. Um, that would be really easy to work in. Um, this one obviously is in stockinette stitch with the garter at the bottom, but I think you could really be quite creative and plug in some, some patterning and stuff. So I think I might do that with my next one and just add some really simple yarn overs. Um, kind of like 
Oh, what's that pattern? I think it's a Stephen West pattern. He's got the, oh, like Boneyard. You know how he has like the garter, that pearl bump row every so often? I think you could do that with some yarn overs every so often. Um, yeah, it would just be really cool. And it's such an easy pattern. So anybody who hasn't done a shawl before or really wants to knit with their hand spun and they haven't yet, um, you could plug in any needle size because you just adjust your needle size and then you just knit till you till it fits because um, it's all based on measurement. Um, so Mari's was... I think she knit hers, hers was worsted weight and she did it on five millimeter needles. Um, Rebecca did hers on a different size and with different weight of yarn. Becca did hers with different yarn, different yardage. So you could really kind of plug in whatever you want. So, which is really cool. It makes it a very diverse pattern to be able to play with. So that is the escarpment cowl. And like I said, it'll be linked in the uh, show notes. And you can really see the gradient there. It's really pretty. I love how it turned out. So that was a win, which is nice because um, I was starting to feel like when I was knitting this, I was starting to feel like because I had to add inches to this and uh, there was a couple other things that happened that didn't go quite so well. And I was like, oh, I'm just have nothing. I'm not winning. But this turned out really, really well. So I was happy about that. So um, I need to stand up and stretch because I can feel my back is starting to seize up. So, oh yeah, this would be a great pattern for art yarn too because it would really showcase the art yarn without having to all that bulk of a handkerchief kind of look. So yeah, great idea, uh, Rebecca. Um, I hope everybody's doing really well. I hope you had a good time in the live stream. Have a wonderful couple of weeks. Our next live stream will be on May uh, 22nd. And um, at the same time, I think in June, we're going to run into some problems because Nora's going to be finished preschool. So I'm going to figure that out. But I think we might actually trial doing one live stream quite early in the morning, like I think at like 6 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. So I know that'll be hard for people on the West Coast, but we'll be able, but that means that some people that are on the uh, East Coast and on the other side of the world would be able to um, participate. So we'll play with that a little bit and see how that works out. But um, I'm just going to um, sort of, June and July are always difficult months for the um, for the show and getting it recorded and getting it out. Um, it's been an issue every single year for the last, like, however, however long I've been doing this for. Um, so I hope um, that y you guys don't mind sort of just going with the flow for a couple of months. It's always like the childcare piece is always the issue. So um, thank you for your patience over the next couple of months. And it doesn't mean the show's not going to come out. It's just going to be probably uh, streamed at different times. So... Um, I hope maybe that means that some people who haven't been able to join us will be able to join us for, for a couple months, so, which is exciting. So I hope you guys have a wonderful couple weeks, um, and I will talk to you next time. Happy spinning. Bye, everyone.